everyone. Uh, it is precisely four o'clock and uh, calling the Town of Portola Valley Finance Committee to order. It's great to see everyone here during a nice hot day outside. Um, so I will uh, run the ro roll call here. I'm here and um, Stephen Cassani. Here. Kenneth Levine. Here. Chris Rittler. Here. Michelle Takai. Here. Bill Urban. Here. Mark Wasser. Here. All right, brilliant. We are all here uh, for an important meeting, which is very good. Um, before we get into uh, today's agenda, uh, the next item is any oral communications for items not on the agenda today? Here in the room. How about online? Oh, I see some hands raised. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Teresa Godfrey, I think you're first. We can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Great. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, acknowledging me. I'm Teresa Godfrey. I'm the um, chair of the Woodside Highlands Road Maintenance District Resident Advisory Committee. And I've been watching with interest what's going on with the finances of Portola Valley. And of course, I'm quite concerned as a resident, but I'm also concerned as uh, the chair of the road maintenance district. Um, I know that um, we haven't had a chance to talk about road maintenance districts, but uh, for those who don't know, um, we tax ourselves for road maintenance um, purposes. And uh, we collect money, the money is collected from the county and it's maintained in the town. And so I just wanted to make sure that as conversations move forward with any changes, any reductions, any tracking that road maintenance, our road maintenance district funds are um, acknowledged in some way, set aside and uh, understand that, that, that these funds are separate from um, regular town funds. Um, Thank you for that. that. That's really all I wanted to say at this point. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and next up is Caroline Bertongen. Caroline, do you have anything to say? We can't hear you. Okay, I, I don't hear anything. One more, one more try, Caroline. Do you want to make sure mute is off and all that kind of thing? Okay, well, I didn't hear you. If if you're having technical problems, um, you can come back in later on and we'll take whatever it is you're trying to say. Um, let's see, moving to item three. Um, this would be announcements and presentations. I don't have any, um, and I don't think anyone else does. So we'll progress along to item four, approval of the minutes of the September 9 meeting. I think everyone has a copy and hopefully reviewed them. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve? I just have one. I, I should have mentioned this uh, previously. Just one clarification. So under the working group updates, the user utility tax, uh, it says read, uh, led by Chris Rittler and Mark Waysar. I am not on that uh, working group. I don't know, Chris, who the, your counterpart is. Oh, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, darn, I couldn't get away with that. Okay, yeah. so let's um, <laughs> let's correct that. Where's the minutes here? Um, I don't think I printed out my copy of the minutes. So we will change uh, the attend the, the UUT committee member to me. Uh, Chris and Mark. And it's Chris and Mark. No, Chris and George. George, that's right. Okay, so uh, with that change, which I will make immediately after this meeting, uh, do I have a motion to approve? I'll move to uh, adopt the minutes. Okay. Others? Second? Second. Um, in favor? Oh, any high. any opposed? Okay, great. We've approved the uh, minutes with one minor change for for accuracy, um, and we'll move straight ahead to the main topic today: new business. Um, as many have seen, and indeed it's been posted on PB Forum from the packet today, we have new cash reserve projections that are, uh, I think it's fair to say, alarming, and certainly our general fund balance is lower than we previously thought. Um, I think we'll all benefit from hearing from our finance director, Tony McFarlane, 
on the detail here uh, that's gone into his um, projection, what's included, what isn't, uh, and just how that fits into the overall budget. Uh, on this agenda item, this is going to be quite lengthy because we want to incorporate a discussion of both the budget, the update, and um, then our working group sort of synthesis of where we are right now in our thinking and how, again, in a brainstorming sense, that might apply to what we're about to learn. So with that, I'll hand it over to Tony. Thank you, George. Um, let me share my screen real quick. So hopefully everybody is seeing the, uh, the spreadsheet that was uh, presented over the weekend. Um, this is um, beginning with fiscal year 2021, um, our audited financial statements, and then um, entering our financial information as, as that has been booked for 21-22, 22-23, and 23-24. Um, and then also there's a column for the 24-25 budget and um, a column for the uh, revised budget. Um, so I'm projecting the general fund reserve for fiscal year 24-25 at 1.583 million, and which is below the 60% threshold. Uh, this number is projected to be the floor and should not go any lower as revenue still needs to be posted uh, from prior years. For example, business license revenue and park field, rental field, <clears throat> uh, rental fees in fiscal year 23 and 24. Um, finance is still currently identifying revenue not posted and making sure that it is posted in the correct period. Uh, as a result, the town's budget is structurally imbalanced. Over the past four fiscal years, recurring revenues, such as taxes and fees, have not kept pace with recurring costs, such as the sheriff's contract and benefits. Also, the use of ARPA funds has masked the increase in recurring costs. One-time costs for planning and town attorney associated with the housing safety element have also played a role in depleting the reserve. Looking at the, on the expense side, um, the consulting costs, um, specifically in the planning division, um, total costs from 2021 through 23-24 has totaled 1.5 million, excluding recurring costs of 80 to $1,000, $100,000 per year. And that is the recurring costs for town planner uh, and also services provided by consultants in, in lieu of an actual staff person. Um, it is estimated that 1.1 to 1.2 million was spent on consultants for the housing safety element update over the past three fiscal years. And you can see in 2021, it was 82,000 in 21-22, Increased to 408,000 in 2223 was 621,000 and then uh, went back down in 2324 to 423,000. Um, looking at the town attorney, um, similar, similar pattern, um, 157,000 in 2021, 255,000 in 21 22. 22, 23 is 350,000, 23, 24 is about 434,000. Uh, so over those four years, it's total 1.19 million. Uh, costs range from a low of 157,000 in 2021 to 434,000 in 23, 24. Uh, we are still currently reviewing all the invoices uh, from our town attorney, uh, just to see how much is related to the housing safety element. <clears throat> As costs has, have increased approximately 90,000 per year. There are also other uh, one-time costs related to uh, um, employee um, personnel issues and, and, and the like. Um, the big elephant in the room is the sheriff's contract. Um, costs have totaled over $6 million from fiscal year 2021 through 2324. Um, 5.3 million has been charged to the general fund with $700,000 charged to other funds, including the COPS grant fund and the public safety augmentation fund. And then $403,000 in ARPA funds was used in 23-24. Without using the ARPA funds, that general fund reserve goes down to 1.1 million. Um, and looking at um, 
So the costs have increased from 1.25 million in 2021 total to 2.346 million in 24-25. That's almost a double in five years. Um, now, we do have a $443,000 credit for 24-25. So that number is actually 1.9 million of which 1.7 will be charged to the general fund. But from 2021 to 2425, the general fund has paid an additional $700,000 towards the sheriff's contract. As I mentioned earlier, the town did receive about 1.1 million ARPA funds that have been used for recurring costs, such as the sheriff's contract, employee retention and maintenance. The use of ARPA funds for recurring costs have masked some of the increases in other expense categories such as personnel and maintenance. And looking at the 24-25 budget, without significant cuts to the proposed 24-25 budget, general fund reserves will end in a deficit. Staff has identified approximately 1.9 million in expense reductions and revenue increases that will keep the reserve in a surplus at year end. And these, I will show those right here. As you can see, uh, property tax and um, based on the corn and cone revised report we, we, we received in, um, I'm drawing a blank, I won't go, but we did receive a, re a revised report um, and it increased about $30,000 in secured and unsecured property tax. We also took a look at what we receive in ERAF and property transfer tax and adjusted those upwards as we wanted to match what we received on average. Um, and so that increased revenues a little bit. And also we had not included some encroachment permit revenue and sots to tots. So revenue increases of about $187,000. On the expense side, looking at salaries and benefits, we have vacant positions. We're gonna take advantage of those, but unfortunately those are only gonna be one-time savings for this fiscal year. Um, Looking into 25-26, we're going to have to really look at the size of FTE. Uh, the budget for 24-25 had FTEs for 20. Uh, we might have to go down to 14 or 15 uh, as we further discuss what needs to be done for the next few years. Um, also, for supplies and services, we were able to identify an additional $95,000 that we can switch to the COPS grant in, in regards to the sheriff's contract. And then looking at transfers out for capital, we had 1.17 million budgeted in the budget. Um, and we're revising that to exclude about $910,000. So the net change in the budget is 1.97 million. And our projected reserve at the end of 24-25 is going to be approximately, um, approximately $695,000. As I stated earlier, these expense reductions are one-time savings for this fiscal year only. Action needs to be taken immediately to address the structural imbalance in the town's budget. Restoring reserves to the 60% threshold cannot be accomplished through cuts alone. There are recurring costs that the town has little control over, such as the sheriff's contract and benefits. The current budget includes funding for 20 FTE, vacant positions in the current year have been frozen, except for the town clerk, town engineer, and town manager. Uh, these, these positions are essential to town operations. The number of FTEs will need to be drastically reduced for fiscal year 25-26. Um, at the next council meeting, a user fee study is going to council for authorization next week. Uh, as part of this re building reserves, revenue enhancement has to be considered. Um, additional rue revenue will need to be considered or the town is on the road to becoming unincorporated. For long-term planning, the finance committee working groups have been studying topics that can address the reserve shortfall with calculated long-term planning. They have looked at reserve levels, charter towns, uh, potential revenue, et cetera. I'm looking for the finance committee's assistance in developing a long-term financial plan that restores the proper reserve levels that can absorb significant increases in one-time costs allows for recurring revenues to keep pace with the recurring costs and maintain the town's viability. Some questions that need to be answered during this process, first and foremost, do we remain a town or disincorporate? 
Number two, what is the appropriate reserve level? Number three, what is the appropriate balance between FTE and use of consultant? Number four, what efficiencies can be identified to reduce costs for services, maintenance, et cetera? And number five, what revenue enhancement measures should be considered? User fee studies, temporary or permanent tax measures, charter town. And I want to acknowledge that for the town to ask for revenue, is it going to be a giant leap of faith? Um, what reporting has come from the town has been woefully deficient. And I just want to acknowledge that we have to have revenue in order to rebuild reserves. And I just want to also acknowledge that it will be a giant leap of faith um, for the town to believe and uh, trust what we need to do in order to restore our reserves. So with that being said, um, show a chart here. And it hasn't updated. A chart that tracks how um, so I have a chart, I've built a chart here that starts from fiscal year 2014 15 and it projects all the way to 2029 2030. Um, the blue line is our policy reserve level. The green line is our historic revenue. The red line is expenses. The black line is the general fund reserve policy. And I wanna point out this intersection right here in 22-23. That should have been the time we should have started having conversations about our long-term plan. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. The, reserve, the reporting coming from finance was not, again, as I said, appropriate. Um, and this information should have been presented and long-term planning should have been discussed back then. We still have opportunity to address these issues very quickly. Um, and I've developed a tool that, um, that can help us with determining what steps we can take, what measures we can take, um, how, what revenue we can ask for, how will it impact the reserves, and then looking on the expense side cuts, and then we can project out where the reserve levels are gonna be. Um, but um, I will, I'm going to be leaning on the finance committee with all the work that you have done. So we need to understand what, what is the appropriate reserve level? Is it 60, is it maintaining 60%? If it's 60%, then we have a lot more work to do in order to get to 60%. Is it 40%? Is it 50%? Is it 30%? Um, but I will be looking for the finance committee to make that recommendation. Um, also revenue measures. Some to consider is reallocating UUT from open space to 2%, from open space to general fund. Now, these temp, these, Revenue measures will be temporary. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing a five year window. You know, we have these new revenues to build up our reserves. We get our costs in line. We do an organizational assessment. We understand what the right staffing levels are. We look at all our contracts and determine what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, um, things that should have been done. Um, but now this is now is the time that we have to do it. Um, so, I will be making this chart available to the entire finance committee um, so that you can play around with it. Um, and do we have a second meeting scheduled? Okay, in two weeks. Two, two weeks. Okay, so yeah, so we can come back in two weeks and firm up what the recommendations are gonna be that I'll be taking to council um, on the 25th. That concludes my report. And I'll give it back to the committee. Yeah, that's great. I'll open it up to uh, everyone here on the days. Tony, uh, that's a very interesting and useful spreadsheet. Um, thank you. You sent out a, or we received a spreadsheet, which I think was also generated by you. Um, 
oh, about a week earlier than this spreadsheet, which had um, 2021 through 2324, and then the two budget items for next this Correct. year. And the um, total fund balances between the first spreadsheet you sent and the second one are significantly different. And so I'm asking you, why was where was the error? Is it on the first spreadsheet or the second spreadsheet? Because in uh, if we look at the results that we're showing, which are unaudited for 2324, the ending total fund balance is a million five eighty three. Correct. If we look at your first spreadsheet, the total fund balance is two million nine hundred eighty five. Oh, uh, this is the spreadsheet that had the columns that I read before. Um, and that's the one you received on? I don't have the date when I received it, but it was about a week before you sent the big one that, that you did recently displayed, and that's displayed now. Um, can I show it to you? Yeah. No, it's different. It's two million nine. Look at two million nineteen. So there's a small difference. Yeah. I don't know. It may have been updated. Um, one obvious suggestion. One obvious suggestion, um, Tony, if you can put some kind of a title or label on everything you send to us um, so we can keep them uh, separate. You've been very generous with what you've sent to us, but it, we're, we are struggling a little bit with sorting it out in terms of timing and so forth. So the difference is 2.98 million to 3 million. So it's about 15, 16,000. No, the difference that I see is um, on the chart we're looking at, if we look at 2324, correct, the very bottom line total fund balance is a million five eighty three. I think these are both PDFs, is my recollection. Yeah. I don't think it. I don't think it changes the conclusions you've expressed, um, but it may change the timing. What's the title of it? From September ninth. 2024-25 GF reserve calculation. He has, he has the same number I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I don't. We're not speaking. <laughs> okay, so um, and so what's the discrepancy here, Ken? Um, I think the number on the sheet that I just gave Tony was two million nine eighty five. Yeah, that's for twenty three twenty four, and then it says right. budget twenty four. And, and the twenty three twenty four on the spreadsheet that's in front of us is a million five eighty three. Oh, I see. Um, so it's a it's a million five off, or is it 
approximately a million five difference. Gotta bring which, and I don't know which one's right. Bring this back up. I mean, the, I mean, obviously, I did update some numbers from when you first got it to when I got. Um, I just, I'm looking at the current one's correct. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the, but I mean, I'm looking at the beginning number in the one you gave me. It's 1.55 million for 24.25. And I'm, I've updated to 1.583, so it's not that big of a difference. Could it be possible that the, the reason for the numbers was using ending numbers versus beginning numbers of the year? It, it, that might account for it being in the wrong column if we had starting versus ending. Because, I mean, I, I've recreated it in this fiscal forecast spreadsheet that I'm going to send you. I, I still come up to 1.583 million. Um, but I'm looking at change in fund balance for there was about a fifteen sixteen thousand dollar difference um, on the twenty twenty one numbers, um, but four ninety five thousand for twenty one twenty two. And this is the change in fund balance one point six two five million in twenty two twenty three, one point four three five million in 2324 again those numbers are unaudited but that's what we've posted so far and the numbers will change as we post additional revenues and but i'm saying the floor is 1.53 or yeah tony i want to go back to what george just said because george you were saying if you look at ending fund balance on these sheets right they tie yeah. So I don't I don't know the difference between the sheets, but right. if you look at ending fund balances. Right. Because that's the calculation. Yeah, I, I think we must just have been reporting yeah. the total at the end of the period instead of the yeah. beginning. But obviously you can double check that. That doesn't yeah. change where we are now. Yeah, the two point nine eight number is the beginning fund balance. So let's start with what we're confident in. We're confident that at the beginning of this fiscal year we had one five eight three. Correct. Basically, or one eight five eight four rounding, and that your forecast at the end of the year to be around six ninety five, with the identified Safe. reduction that's coming. So yeah. that's like a nine hundred thousand dollar deficit, if you will, even with the cuts. Correct. For, for this coming year. Right. Okay. So and yeah. with and with updated revenue assumptions that you walked through, which weren't major, but yeah, it, it yeah that number includes. The increases in revenue and the decreases in expenses. Right. We, we go from 2.9 million to 895. Right. Now this has a lot of deferral built into it. What, in terms of your best estimate, if we're talking about uh, all the items you mentioned remaining in town, I think we're all in favor of that. If we can do that, so I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but um, uh, uh, the appropriate efficiencies. Uh, reserve level we can discuss. Mm -hmm. First thing we have to do is have a balanced budget before reserves matter, right? So, well, it, it there's a difference between a balanced budget and a structurally balanced budget. Yeah, and we we need to like the goal needs to be structurally balanced. No, no, I get it. Yeah. But, but but at a moment um, before I'm rebuilding reserves, I want to stop hemorrhaging money. Exactly. Okay. Right. So um, that's the initial goal. Um, so there's going to be efficiencies, and then of course revenue enhancement. If we think about um, items one through four for the moment as um, we'll, we'll all be focusing on that and we want to have a slight quote unquote surplus to rebuild reserves. What would be a prudent number for us to plan for on the revenue enhancement front? Uh, and I, I, I'm just trying to get an order of magnitude because clearly I don't think $900,000, i.e. meeting this year's deficit would do it because we have a sheriff contract escalating and that's Correct. built in. Um, and we have to rebuild our reserves, mm -hmm. and we deferred all kinds of things. Some of which we, some of which we can get rid of permanently, but I, I bet we can't get rid of all of it permanently. So it'll be some bigger number than that. And I'm just wondering if you have a feel for that. Yeah, it would be 
somewhere between one to 1.5 million. What was that? One to 1.5 million. In, in annual revenue. In annual revenue. Okay. For the next five years. I, I would put minimum one to 1.5 million. Minimum. Just looking at these numbers. I'm sorry, that, that doesn't rebuild the reserves, though, does that? Well, that that infuses new revenue into the general fund. Then we can also tackle salaries, benefits, maintenance, services on the expense side. But it's we're still going to have to figure out a way to get around the sheriff's county. And then mm -hmm. if there's another element update, three, four years down the line, we need to have a reserve level at a point where we can actually absorb that hit and not have this I'm conversation. Sorry, but, but the 1.5 wouldn't build us back up to whatever 60% reserve or whatever whatever number we decide. Then that's the, we need to determine what is the, the, the reserve level. I'm now. sorry, so the 1.5 is just to break even, is that right? Or? No. no, that will that will build reserves. Oh, that will build, okay. That will build reserves, but we have to get to the point where our revenues are actually coming in higher than the increases in our expenses. And as I stated, there's some expenses that are beyond our control. So the other item that we need to look at, which I don't think was included in the list, is how long this it'll take to get additional revenue. Because it seems to me that what we looked at last time, or our last meeting, mm -hmm was that the earliest this could ha be voted on is, is uh, uh, two years from now. And if it's a parcel tax, we don't get the money until a year after that. If it's a property tax, um, transfer tax, uh, we get it starting in January. Uh, so that would be two years plus a few months, five, four months from now. If you adhere to that schedule, yes. But right. If, if we declare a fiscal emergency, we can put a sales tax, or sorry, I keep saying sorry, a revenue measure on the next election. We can actually hold a special election. And if we can do that in March and have it, the result, if it passes in July, we, have, we can submit the parcel tax to the county assessor in July and we can receive the money next fiscal year. Okay, so my point is that the timing will determine how much our reserves go down right luckily we have some runway because we have substantial reserves even though they're they're restricted um i from what we said last time we can still access those or borrow from them or something we can only borrow from them within one fiscal year in one fiscal year so if we borrow in 25 if we borrow in july we have to repay by june 2026 oh, so you can you have to pay it back in a year is what you're saying yes well, then that's then we have even less runway than we think yeah. than we thought at least i thought and, and what is our total cash balance in all of these various funds how much cash total we have about 22 23 million 12 million of that is open space 8 million and then there's 4 million in the inclusionary housing fund and then the rest is made up of other restricted funds in regards to transportation measure a measure m Major W, uh, and we have the COPS grant. In, in, um, okay. So it's, it's you know, there are some specific purposes for these funds. If we can tie a general fund expense to that specific purpose, then we can, but I mean, it's not, it's, it's not a, uh, there's many, there's a few options there that we can access those funds. But to be in sync and on timing, um, if we end this fiscal year, with uh, six hundred thousand dollars, and we needed to take a loan from one of the other funds, mm -hmm. that would we'd have to pay it back by the end of that fiscal year. Correct. Right. So we would need revenue to fund that payment. Right? Correct. So, so in theory, we could have a revenue measure voted on at the end of this fiscal year, right? Yes, but that would not, say if it's a parcel tax, that would not be able to get on the property tax roll until the next year because- Right, but I'm saying- if it's, if it's in right, June, so. if, we have, if we have the election in June, 
and the certification takes 30 to 45 days, we might not meet the deadline to get on because th those are due by the end of July. So when we do all the, in the, the road maintenance districts, and I just want to say the road maintenance districts will not be touched. Um, the, um, those, we submit those to the county assessor's office in July. So timing issues with parcel tax, which we should just make certain that we're completely accurate on. User utility tax, I believe we could that, that would be a reallocation of user that utility would be tax. Yes. Um, quickly. Yes. Right. So, all right. I think, I think getting this timeline down is critical, right? So that we're all in sync. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and figuring out how we can do a loan potentially yeah. within that time frame to bridge us. For well, fiscal year, right? Yeah, if if we think about timelines, um, first of all, I I'll, I'll just share some of my own thinking on this, and everyone debate it, right? But in having heard through the working groups over the last couple of sessions, and thought about things, um, in the long term, meaning over the next five years, I think an ideal project to embark on would be to seek legal assistance in increasing the amount of property tax we get. From the county of San Mateo, um, they've changed the determination of how they bill us for sheriff services, and they structurally pay less to us back in property tax than pretty much anybody else. So I, I'm guessing here. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I haven't done the project, but I think it's probably worth the investment to see if there's anything there because thanks to the sensitivity analysis that I think you did, Chris, it shows that every one percent that we get back in property taxes, $700,000 a year in, in income. So that means that if we could get a little bit more back of what we're paying into the county, um, you know, our five-year revenue enhancement measure would be an actual temporary measure, unlike, you know, a permanent temporary tax Correct. that tends to happen in the rest of our lives. And, and, you know, I'm suspicious of quote unquote temporary taxes without a plan to get rid of them. And this would be one avenue. Second avenue would be the charter town proposal that would enable us to do a parcel transfer tax, which means that people as they're exiting the community or selling their house and it's a one-off event and they pay, you know, a bit of extra money as they do in San Jose and elsewhere. And that could potentially also be a long-term fix. The reason I don't put that in the short-term budget is having a new charter for your town in the election around that raises appropriately a whole lot of other issues about what's going to be in that charter you know, what, what reflects the values of the town, et cetera, that go well beyond raising revenue. So I would imagine that would take more time. Yeah, and money. That's right. We have to invest in that. Stephen just said, and money, for those of you online. Um, and then a potential short-term idea. Again, this is from Chris's sensitivity analysis that he um, uh, shared with us last meeting. I'm not sure if I remember to include it in the packet for this meeting. Um, I hope I did, but if not, it's in the prior one. Um, and uh, uh, reassigning temporarily the open space fund user utility tax to the general fund uh, for a period of time would be about $400,000 per year. Now, this would actually amount in a cash terms to a wash for the open space fund because currently the open space fund is earning a similar amount, uh, about $400,000 a year in interest which formerly it never, it never earned because the inflation was very low mm -hmm. and we did not have um, the kind of interest bearing account set up that we established. So I, I know the argument on purchasing power would suffer, right. uh, but you know, an argument can be made that right now the open space fund is growing like gangbusters, which normally would be a wonderful thing that I would support, except in the context of us having to dissolve as a town because we're out of money that we can spend on essential services. So that's an idea. And then the second thing is if there were, say, a $600, million, a $600 parcel tax, um, again, the analysis shows something like a million dollars a year from, from those two, from, from that item. So the combination would be $1.4 in total, which could cover us while we focus on trying to get more property tax. And that might be worth hiring a lawyer for. Sure, it's just to add, though, um, so a parcel tax, as we discussed, I would say is medium, right? And maybe we define short-term, long-term, medium-term, yeah. right? Short-term would be within a fiscal year. 
True. Medium term would be, you know, one to two fiscal years. Well, you know, and long term would be greater than two fiscal years. But I think we would need an election in any event for UUT. So couldn't we right. have the UUT and the property tax at the same election? Well, but the, I mean, Tony's, I just want to understand Tony's point better on parcel tax. It sounded like you were concerned about getting the proceeds of that within a fiscal year. If we, to get it within the next fiscal year, we would have to have the election certified before July, the end of July. And we can do that with a fiscal emergency, is that? Yeah, in order to get to on the next election cycle, we have to declare a fiscal emergency. If we do it in March, we have to declare a fiscal emergency in December. And I assume we qualify. Is there what? Is that a big? Well, we're, we're 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 doing the we're doing the analysis right now. It's we are looking at having a negative fund balance unless we receive additional revenue, and um, so we need to declare a fiscal emergency in order to get on the next election cycle. With that, then we can get on the election cycle and. Also want to add a parcel tax and the UUT, those are special taxes. So they're, they're going to require two thirds majority of registered voters in the town. Yeah, so it could fail. It could fail. And and if it fails, I'd rather fail sooner so we know what we have to do. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, I was hoping that we would have all the audits up to date and we'd have our house in order before right. we had to go to the voters. That was the original plan before we discovered that our while our and for those online, let me explain what I think I know from you, Tony, and, and please correct me if I'm saying anything incorrectly here. But um, the issue is that the town has plenty of cash. So, uh, and that when we talk about, well, fortunately we have great reserves, but in the lack of audited financials, allocating which funds belong in which uh, spending categories has been inexact. And as we're getting um, the audits uh, preparation under our belts and appropriately assigning funds to each uh, designated account, uh, we're learning that more of this cash is restricted than was mm -hmm. originally uh, thought by Sharif and you when you first came on the scene. Is that right? I I would I would add that the it's the general fund cash available cash is dwindling as well. Um, but yeah, the, the, the restricted funds that we have are for specific purposes. We just can't rate them. And no, no, that's right. No one would propose rating them. But I, I, I believe what we were told in the past was that the general fund number as a proportion of the, we know what we have as cash because that's in a bank statement right. every month. Right. Uh, we assumed or thought incorrectly that the general fund proportion was higher than it turns out to be. Correct. Um, and so that's why we have less time, because I'm just trying to explain for those at home, for example, who are paying attention to this and remember that in April we had a meeting saying, well, you know, we have three years to figure this out, which means we could go through the normal course of things, um, trim the budget, get our audit house in order, and then have an election if we needed any revenue measures. Right. And now we're, we're sort of going into a hurry up offense. Right. Okay. Right. And that April meeting, we were still figuring out you know, where we were with the audits, where we were with each fiscal year. Right. And it wasn't until having the 2021 audit. And then notice, since I've been here, we can tell you how many journal entries I've reviewed and posted. But we're working in 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25. So we are working in four current concurrent fiscal years and just identifying, making sure we're posting in the correct periods. And for the most part, we are. Um, but I was able, finally able to get to a point where I can say 21, 22, those numbers are about 98%. Yep. 22, 23, about 80%, 85%. 23, 25, 23, 24 is a little bit higher than 22, 23, because when I came on board, my focus was, okay, let's get 23, 24 current as much as possible. And then 24, 25, we are posting, we are current, um, and, um, but looking at the numbers, seeing where the, that fund balance reserve is going to be, um, where it's projected to be, um, and it could go up. I mean, it, but it's not going to get to a point where it's 
30% or 40%, it's still going to be between 20 and 25%. And, and just on a related point, um, we, we still have confidence that we're going to get all the audits done this fiscal year? That is still the plan. So I understand to borrow from the restricted funds requires that it gets repaid in the same fiscal year. Is that what I heard? Yes. Is there any way to that is established in the California government code? Okay. And there's just no flexibility. What happens if you can't repay it within the fiscal year? Um, well, you'll get Sacramento's attention. And um there in fact there is a town or a city in the Sacramento area um where they were a bit loose with the, the loans. And uh, they are currently under investigation. Well, I, I do like the question, though, because if you're thinking about going to a vote to like do a parcel tax or reallocate user utility tax or increase user utility tax, we should investigate the opportunity to maybe redirect funds that already exist, right? Or to have a longer term loan period in acknowledgement of the, you know, the emergency situation, right? And just say, well, we need a three-year loan, you know, and put it up. Potentially, maybe that's a votable decision. I don't know, Tony. I don't know about that. I don't know enough to comment on that. Yeah, I'd have to look into. So maybe we can take an action on that. To but do I, some I, I don't think we should consider an action that might not be compliant with state law. Well, again, we're. I guess, I, you know, I, I don't want to uh, raise alarm. However, we as a community have voted to have a significant investment in open space Correct. funds. And we now have a significant balance on open space mm -hmm. funds. And if we want to consider extending better loan terms to ourselves for our open space funds temporarily to fund an emergency, that doesn't seem like a sacramental thing to me, but I'm not right. A but politician. any any action we take has to be in compliance with state law. Yeah, and and there's a specific government code for interfund loans. Okay, and so, so anytime you, we're borrowing from another fund, it's an interfund loan. So do you think this is worth looking into or tabling? I'd no. say it's worth tabling. Um, <laughs> worth I mean, it, it's it, we need more information to. to yeah, I, I want to well, say. I, I think the question. I assume the question is: Should we get legal opinion on whether this is possible? If we only have uh, twelve months, or if we have yeah. long. I mean, it seems to me if it's a fairly quick conversation with a knowledgeable right. attorney, it might be worth pursuing. And and then we obviously wouldn't proceed if there's right. if the answer is no. But, I don't. I mean, know. you'll you you can ask two attorneys, and they'll <laughs> they'll have difference of opinions. Well, it would be interesting to know what the town yeah. attorney thinks of yeah. that. And I want to underscore that I'm only interested in this as an emergency sort of timing thing to fix things, because I'm reasonably certain that one of the rationales behind the relevant California code is to avoid people just shoving off, correct, delaying hard decisions and borrowing funds. And then at the end of the day, you realize that as you're borrowing funds, you're doubling your problem because you now have a structural indebtedness to pay off as well as your structural deficit. right you're not you're not bringing in additional revenue to the general fund with a loan yeah it's just the reality right is, but um, the inner fund right. loans are usually for cash flow yeah we, we right. need a bridge not a pier we understand the the reality we also have to look at is the magnitude of the revenue streams that are possible which mm -hmm. is what we reviewed last time yeah right so you know Two and a half percent of two percent of UUT is four hundred thousand dollars. I'm doing that from memory, but right. And right. we we're looking at one point five million of additional revenue. Right. Yep. We just have to be real. Yes. Right. All yes, of us. we have and, to have a frank conversation. Yeah. Yes. That we you know we got to figure out how to get to one point five. Is my right. opinion. Well, that, that and then we can maybe pair back. Yeah. That that's right. That that's why I like the the longer term idea of trying to get more property tax out of San Mateo. And I mean, not just having a phone call with somebody, but actually looking into the law and that would be worth funding at some level. Um, Charter town is again, something to really consider, but again, that's, this is all more complicated. Um, 
So the five-year strategy seems like an appropriate approach to me and uh, something on the order of $1.3, $1.5 million in the net range would be maybe relevant. As we look at the um, assigned but unrestricted funds that this exercise was trying to get a, a more updated view on, I know I've said this in a previous meeting, but I do think it bears reiterating, is that all of these categories of assigned funds, I believe, are within the discretion of the town council to reallocate. There are two that I'm particularly sensitive to. One is the unfunded pension liability of about $712,000. The other is OPEB, the okay. other post-employment benefit, which at least in the, in the packet that we got in preparation for this meeting is about 834,000. So let's just say about 1.5 million in total. Even though they are unrestricted technically, I would be very reluctant to advise the town council to do anything with those, borrow against them, spend them, because these are obligations that the town has for the purposes of benefits for current, but really previous employees. And I think that those we sh the town council in its, in its wisdom should be treating those, in my opinion, as fully restricted funds not to be spent. Um, I'd just like to add on to that. So in 2122, the town opened a trust for OPEB. Um, those numbers haven't been updated in its calculations. So the 2122 act for should have what that balance is. We sent about six, I think almost $600,000 into this trust fund. Um, so that's going to replace that line or it's going to reduce that line, whatever the difference is, what the, what the liability is and what the balance in the trust is. So we have a trust set up for OPEB. So that should alleviate that concern. But yeah, the pension liability is, that's established through CalPERS, there's GASB 68, and that's something we need to carry um, on our plan. Yeah, we, we, our use, problem used to be we had too much cash. And Bill, you were instrumental in dealing with some of this a while back. So why don't you comment on that? Yeah, so I, I think it was four, five, six years ago um, when we had a, a really large reserve fund. I mean, it was actually excessive. And we were saying, what's a productive use of that? I said, let's get aggressive about paying off uh, some of this long-term liability. So both the, you know, the CalPERS mm -hmm. and the OPEB, those are long-term right. liabilities. They're eventually going to have to be paid, but they don't have to be paid next year or the year after that and there's plenty of private companies and so forth that carry very very large unfunded liabilities for their corporate pension plans mm -hmm. and we can and could do that in the future in other words we find the face of what you just suggested which is is not it, it, which is to take those assigned funds those categories and actually spend them to pay down if we're trying to buy time which I think we all agree is what we're trying to do, regardless of what the dollar amount is or where it comes from. We're trying to buy time. That's as good a place as any to buy time because we don't have to pay those assigned funds for that purpose this year or next year or the year after that. I mean, eventually we're going to have to pay them, but that actually is a source of short-term cash that is easier to get at than um, borrowing from a uh, res actually restricted fund or going out to the public. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to have, I, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to say we're going to suspend actual payments to defer long-term liabilities because we don't have to pay them now. We've got shorter term needs that have to be met. And that's just kind of a trade-off we're going to have to make, but it still isn't going to give us enough money to, you know, even if we do that, the problem is that's not even the solution. We are either going to have to, find some ready source of cash or do some very um, aggressive cost cutting that we probably can't imagine, or we're going to have to dip into the actual restricted funds and borrow and figure out how within 12 months we can make a commitment that we can honor to repay the money with earnings. I mean, we can't, it's not free money. We ought to uh, repay it, but it does buy us another year or nine months to figure this this out. The, the thing is that the runway is shorter than we thought, right? I mean, in fact, every time we come back to this meeting house, it seems like the runway has shortened um, 
And um, so we got to start doing, we got to start making some decisions is basically what has to happen between us and the town council and get some things scheduled because we're, the time is shortening on us and we're not getting to, we're still talking about alternatives and possibilities, but we're not getting to specific scenarios. We ought to develop two specific scenarios and go charge down the road to get one of them um, approved and in place and in time. I think we need two different alternatives because there might, we might find a roadblock down the way. If we, if we go the roadblock of trying to, you know, borrow against restricted funds, we might find there's some other problem we have, even if we could repay it within a year. I don't know what that would be. I never researched it when we did our reserve policy discussion. By the way, one, one thing we haven't brought up here, but when uh, Chris and I did our recommendations about changes to the reserve policy, we actually recommended for the long term that our reserve policy was too high. It didn't need to be as high as 60%, that we thought 25 or 30% would be fine. And that was that actually would find us more time than we have. The problem is we're already up against the, we're going to be breaking through that number by March, right? I mean, we're going to be below 25% or 20% or whatever. Well, by we're, we're currently below 20%. And also, you know, since I since I've been here, like I haven't really committed to all oh, that numbers five million. I, I, in fact, I, I my first presentation was that number is not five million, and I've also commented that that number is probably below the sixty percent threshold. So this number is lower than what my gut was telling me, and I wasn't I was anticipating this number to be between two point five and three million. Um, but when I saw one point five million, like that's lower than even I thought. And, um, but, you know, I, I've, I've been reluctant to commit to a number, uh, since I started uh, because I knew that 5 million number was not, not accurate. Well, what I, in fact, I remember when we got together in May, um, with the preliminary or June, whenever it was with the preliminary budget, uh, we thought we were going to be at, you know, 63% or something of at the end of the year. And now we're going to be at. 25 percent or something so that that things changed Drastic. i mean that changed you just got correct data into right. the system more so data i got more data yes so i have two questions yep. um the first one is that six months nine months ago sharif commented to our committee that he felt that we should the town should declare a fiscal emergency um, i assume that was taken to the um, town council at some point. Does anyone know? And I don't think we have a town council member here today. Um, whether that was taken to the town council and what their re reaction was? I don't believe it. I was. know this is before your time. Yeah, it was so. before my time, but I don't. I don't think that was taken. No. Yeah. I can. Yeah, I'm here. Um, no, that has not, uh, that has been discussed as you just mentioned in, in public meetings, but there haven't been discussion beyond that. And it's obviously something as is being discussed today that needs to be part of the dialogue. Thanks, Sarah. I anticipate it will be within the next, you know, two meetings. So that my second question is that um, one of the spreadsheet we're looking at here um, at the end of this fiscal year, we expect the fund balance to be 694,000 or something. Um, so we're already spending the funds that Mark was referring to the o OPEB and the pension. We're, that's, what, that's what cash we have available. So of Correct. course we're gonna spend it. Yep. We have no choice. <laughs> Wish we had more. I do, I do too. Yeah, but it's it's you know the option is without revenue, then we're looking at draconian a draconian budget where it's bare minimum staff, bare minimum services, and um, I just you know there there are some costs associated with that. So it's you know especially in planning and building, it's longer lead time for permits, it's longer lead time for building inspections, and it's just the availability of staff. We're not going to be there's only going to be a handful and we may run back into the scenario that we just came out of where we're not doing our annual reporting. Um, audits won't get done because uh, we we're just not going to have the bodies in the building to do the work. 
and it's going to rely on increased use of consultant. Yeah, well, we're going to we need to have the reporting accurate. I mean, right. I, I feel as though um, over the last four years, inadvertently, we we've, we've had a man, management disinformation system, you know, rather than the more traditional MIS because we weren't being fueled with correct information. So, and that's meant that a, an easy hole to fix at first is now a very challenging one. So, yep. George, um, I'd also like to comment on your one of your options there, which was uh, try and get more money on our property taxes. Yeah, we've looked at this before, um, and we we had a discussion when Paula Cohn was here. Um, we are a TEA city, which means we get seven percent less whatever the state says, which presently is an ERAF amount uh, that we that lowers us from 7% down to our five and a half or whatever we get today. So I don't think, this isn't a matter of convincing the people that the county that we should get more. It's just a question of, of what the state law is with respect to TEA cities. We're one of the few TEA cities in the state. Yeah. You know, just to follow up on that, actually, Ken's absolutely right. So when Craig Taylor and I had the discussion with the one very helpful representative at the County of San Mateo, that that's exactly what we learned. And um, we also learned that the process to address any perceived changes in interpretation of those laws and allocations is a very laborious and time consuming process. Um, I am actually still doing the work to just validate that the numbers that we saw in the Cohen or in the in Paula Cohen report is accurate. I just wanted to do this as an independent sampling audit. Um, and but but that said, I have at this point, based upon the work that 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 we did and I, I coordinated with Craig Taylor, I don't have any expectation that the number will be higher coming back to us anytime soon. Yeah, I agree with that, which is why I was proposing we look into that on the five-year horizon. Uh, I mean, that would be ideal, and I think it's worth putting significant resource into it, and I'm I'm willing to bet that there are interpretations of the law that would be, you know, arguable and accurate enough to try uh, in a legal sense that might get us some more money, particularly given what the Sheriff's Department just did in terms of changing how they allocate overhead to us. And this is mainly a game where we already send them most of our property tax to the county, which then distributes some to the sheriff, and then we have to pay more for the sheriff, and they've changed their calculation on one side. So I'm just wondering if there's some corresponding way we can change our calculation on the other. Yeah, in relation in speaking to the sheriff's contract, like 21, 22, 22, there's a 9% increase, and then 23, 24, there's a 29% increase. And, and, and my understanding is they changed how they allocate yeah. overhead. So, okay. I mean, one reason overhead was probably allocated the way it was was because we're a TEA city that gets virtually no property tax relative to Woodside and everybody else. Right. So that might be an argument I could make in Superior Court where I, were I an attorney. And I'm not advocating anything except we consider it, look into it, understand it will take years, as you mentioned, Ken. So we can't rely on it for the emergency, but this is one of the things that gives me hope that if I'm doing a five-year tax, if I'm a member of the public, I'm like, yeah, it's a five-year tax. And what's going to happen at the end of five years is it's guaranteed to be renewed or we go bankrupt again because what will change? Well, maybe we could change something here also with um, additional increases in property values, hopefully, as the economy does hopefully well. Uh, people selling their homes maybe will get more property tax revenue in the normal course of events. And if inflation comes down, we'll be able to moderate expenses and those lines will cross at some point. We also have the charter town process, which I mentioned before. But again, as I mentioned, uh, I, my belief is that's a much longer term item because everyone will appropriately want input into the charter, mm -hmm. and that goes well beyond just revenue. Right. What, what, what's going to be in there and what isn't. Right. Well, it needn't, it needn't be that complex. Um, I believe that St. Helena's charter simply says we follow all rules of the state, as we always have, except we are okay. going to have a tax RPTT. No, that's really helpful data because I, I didn't know that. I thought that it meant you have to like adopt a whole new constitution for your town and go through everything. You can, but you're not required to. So okay. um, that doesn't mean that the, the discussion might be wide ranging, but it, you know, going bankrupt tends to focus people's <laughs> attention. So we could either, you know, we can either unincorporate and then become just like- a Yeah, I think it was uh, Samuel Johnson 
uh, commented that the prospect of being hanged in a fortnight focuses the mind wonderfully or something like that. Okay, good um, English major. <laughs> can, can Michelle just refresh my memory? What was the um, projected revenue for a chart? Yeah. Um, well, whatever you wanted to make yeah. it. We, we proposed a $6 per well, thousand evaluation. That's 0.6% sales tax, if you will. And that brings in one and a half million dollars on average year. Triggered by sales. By sales of home. Sales. So it is transfer uh, of title of right. home. It's variable based on home sales. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah okay. And the valuation so, of those homes. Yeah. yeah. But so what sold. but what you modeled just for modeling purposes came to one point five million. We chose the six dollars based on well, $6. right uh, raising. We knew we needed to raise about one and a half million. Yeah. Okay. And, All right. We knew that. And just and six dollars from what I, your presentation. Well, I remember your presentation was and just, reasonable, right? Yeah. And just to reiterate, um, we we can set the tax rate at whatever number makes sense for the projections. Um, just to summarize some of my ideas. I, I totally agree with pursuing the property tax increase or more to whatever extent it makes sense. I I'm, I certainly know nothing about that. Um, I, apparently, because I worked on the um, the property tax uh, transfer I, I, with Ken, um, I, I agree. It to me, it can be a very concise, simple process, um, and I can refer everyone to the Saint Helena website and they are they are voting in november on that so it's it's very current and you'll see they have a much much higher tax rate proposed but that's irrelevant Time. yeah i i think it's because their property tax values are lower but anyway um i i would i think the it, we can simplify the process and if we can get a a special election approved because of our fiscal emergency um, we can have an election before two years from now. What date makes sense is all, all up to how good our data is. But um, I would set the rate high enough so that we can pay back any loans, uh, pay off, uh, I agree, with a pension and um, OPEB. Um, and then what we discussed briefly last time I would have the town vote on a lot, revote on allowing the town council to reduce the UUT property tax at its discretion um, and make that permanent so they could reduce it to whatever. So if we, if we set the, uh, the property tax transfer rate fairly high and say pay and say we got really lucky with the number of sales and can build up our reserves, pay back loans, um, pay off pension debts in three to five years or whatever it would take, then the town council at its discretion could lower the UUT tax. It may not be for a while, so don't get excited, but um, rather than having another election, I, I, I'm one of these people that just likes to keep simple. It's like, okay, we'll do it once, we'll vote, and if it turns out we get a lot of a lot of uh, property tax, property transfers. Well, Lord, the, the UUT, which I don't think anyone's, it's not tax, but, you know, you, you don't get deductions for what you pay of, of any kind. Um, so that's what I would propose. So um, let me, let me see if I hear this right. So the notion would be uh, uh, the UUT, the open space fund would be reallocated to the general fund, but then it could be Reallocated back to the open space fund at the, or are you talking about an increase in the overall? Uh, rate? No, I, I guess I, I'm talking about the five and a half percent that's currently going to the general fund. Um, so just increase that. No, no, I would keep it the same. I would, I would make the, I would set the, the real property transfer tax. Oh, okay. Higher I, at whatever number makes sense, whether it's yeah. six dollars per thousand, seven dollars per thousand, or Saint Helena, which as Ken just said, is some enormous <laughs> amount. Um, um, and I, I I don't like the the, the parcel tax because it takes so long. Right. Um, 
and then we talked about the UUT, like I said, I would keep it the same and but have the ability to reduce it. Okay. If our general fund ever got too large for for Ken uh, for Bill's happiness. So what I'm <laughs> hearing, just again to make sure I got it, because we're getting into real recommendations here to consider. Um, instead of my my proposal is parcel tax and reallocate open space fund portion of the UUT. Your proposal is keep the UUT the same, but restore the ability of town council to reduce the general fund portion of UUT and put in a maximum uh, property transfer tax associated with the charter town, but the maximum rate, again, of which the town council can reduce from that maximum. No, I wouldn't. No, I would have them reducing the UUT or okay, not but, the. But the parcel tax is a fixed number of the transfer. No, I wouldn't tax. have any. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, why I'm, they... I'm, I'm being in, in accurate with my words. But the property transfer tax would be right, and we number. don't we don't know what that's right. going to be. And so the reason, one way, and and this is a real fear that I have is I wouldn't want to create a situation where we wind up awash in money that everyone is then feeling pressure to spend because well, a lot. Well, that's of, why we reduce the UUT, that's how, and then we'd be able to do that to make sure we. Have it, and I would, I think, at one time it was only one percent. I would, I would, you know, if we need to, you know, bring it down to zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. And just the again, it's totally thing. at the discretion of the town council every year. But we wouldn't touch the open. We space. can't. We can't do that. Well, no, not that. It's just we receive UUT monthly. I'm sorry, monthly. Yeah, and if we replace it with the property transfer tax, we get that in December, no, in April. No, no, the, that no. The real pro the real property transfer tax is collected by the escrow company, so that would be current. There's no there's no real estate. It's it's an escrow. You collect it at the close of escrow. Right, but it still comes through the county. Is it? Yeah, so it'll come. We get property tax. Never, we get property tax payments it twice a county? year because it, it's, it's property tax. No, it's but, it's a transfer tax. But it's but it's Real, it's, it's no, tied to property valuation, so it goes to the county. It goes to the assessor's office. I've never seen that. We don't. We didn't. We don't. We didn't I don't. It. Real we don't property. Get, we don't get property transfer tax every time. A property sells. It, Why it not? Goes well, we don't collect it now anyway. The, the county collects any property tax. And it's not a property tax. It's a transfer tax. But it's related to the sale of property. Right. And it's based on the valuation of the property. So it goes to the county assessor's office. We get property track. We get property tax proceeds in December and April. Right, but we're not tied to the June 30 fiscal date. I mean the. Valuation date. That's not related to right. what I'm saying. I'm saying is okay. there's a cash flow issue. We, UUT we get every but, month. Right. Property if it comes back through as property transfer tax, that revenue that we're replacing from UUT we're not getting till December. Okay. Well, again, it, it may take years. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, but I'm just. And I just we would only it. do it once. But, there's okay. there's a cash flow consideration that we also have. But to it, we would collect it faster than a parcel tax, which is tied to that June 30 valuation date, right? I mean, parcel tax would come in the same way. Right. No, but it's you have to tax. hit that that valuation date of June 30, right? Or, or July, like you say, July or mid to late July or something. Well, if we pass parcel tax in May, if we pass the charter town in, or sorry, March, we pass charter town in March, we still have a significant amount of time to get that information to the assessor's office before the end of July so that it shows up on the property. A blend, uh, a blend may make sense. Only, uh, again, I'm thinking about lumpiness. Uh, California is widely uh, sort of takes some hits uh, amongst other states because so much of our income uh, for the state comes from the progressive income tax. And so it's very sensitive to economic conditions, who's selling stock and the stock market. And similarly, how many houses get sold in Portola Valley in a given year would largely de determine that part of our revenue. So we may want some of that in the mix, but I worry about too much on the parcel transfer tax, just because what if there's a year where the economy really hits the skids and no one's really selling their house for whatever reason. Yeah, so we recommended in our discussion last time uh, that we, we raise what we think at that time was $6, which would bring in about one and a half million on average, but not every year. And so we said that we would only spend X of that uh, so that it averages out to one and a half million, but we may bring in one year 1.9 million and the next year 1.2 million, but we have a reserve fund that okay. goes up and down. Sure. Um, and that would have to be created so that 
Yeah, we, we avoid the problem you're addressing. Ho hopefully, in theory, California does that too, except they don't. So are, are you suggesting a separate fund? I'm suggesting that we can't spend all the money that we bring in right. any one year because the next year we but it, it may not bring It's in contained within the general fund. Yes. Okay. So it's just it's the just general a, fund. Um, yeah. So it's, assigned, part, it's just assigned. an assignment that the council can do. Part part of yeah. the reserve policy. Yeah. Yeah. We can do. That. Yeah. Right. Um, and just another clarification. I thought that as long as um, what the voters were uh, were voting on was for general use purposes that only required the majority, so that. So our um, our UUT that goes to the general fund only needed. Fine, but it's also tied. There are two taxes assessed with this UUT. One's, right. One's no. The so general fund. One's the U, one's the open space. And so the open space required. A two, uh, space the, is special. Yeah. But if we're going to be moving from a special restricted fund to right. the general fund, it's still. Yeah. So I'm. I'm not. I'm. That was George's. I. I don't think we should mess with that. Just. Just give the well. Okay. Well, then maybe maybe it's a two percent increase in the tax rate for the general fund for five years, or or that the that the town council can reduce. Oh, so you would you would raise it to um, seven and a half um, up to right. seven and a half. That, that's right. And then, but then give the council the ability to lower it if they Correct. want. And then and then the open space fund would remain at two percent, so it's nine and a half percent. I still think if you do the if you do the real property transfer tax correctly and time it. <laughs> Like Tony thinks we need okay. to. Why? I, I, I personally, I'm I'm a tax person. I'm a income tax. I I hate the. I mean, remember good old Ed Wells? May he rest in peace. He hated that because because he couldn't get a tax deduction. Of course, he 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 preceded the salt limitations. Yeah, but I was anyway, say we can't get tax deductions anyway. For, yeah, for now, well, unless well, that expires. The law expires yeah. next. Anyway, um, I would just. I would try and set, based on any projections we have, I would try and set the rate. Um, and then, I mean, of the, the real property transfer tax, whatever rate makes sense to everyone. I mean, we don't know what that rate is today because we don't have all the numbers. But then let the voters know that maybe there's hope in the horizon. <laughs> maybe more, um, more likely to, to go with the, transfer, with the possibility we, the council could reduce the util and eliminate it except for the except for the um, op open space. Yeah, so I, I, I think I think we've. Uh, I'll speak. I, I find um, Charter Town promising. I think Michelle, what you're hearing is some nervousness or at least risk of other members who are thinking, how quickly can we get this done? Because if we put all of our eggs in the Charter Town basket, and it just drops on the floor and they all break. What are we going to do, right? So I like your idea of pursuing multiple paths, and but you know I think it's parcel tax, it's UUT, you know, and and maybe all and Charter Town, and I like your idea of if Charter Town gets through, then we can back give the town council the ability to reduce those others. Yeah, you can absolutely right? put that in the ballot language that. Yeah. Any given time, town council can yeah. rescind it or extend it or reduce it or you know as long as it's in the ballot measure. I mean, I mean, even if you want to throw in an oversight committee, go ahead. You know, but it's it's um, um, you know you can you can word the ballot language any way you want. If you want to give the council the authority to do that, you can do that. So another advantage of a transfer tax, it's nothing to do with charter, just transfer tax as a way of raising money is that a transfer tax that is designed for the general fund yep. requires only a majority of vote. 50 plus one. Okay, well, well, that's very appealing given the emergency. Um, this very simple St. Helena approach, let, let's say if we're recommending Charter Town, uh, given our um, sort of sphere of activity here on the Finance Committee, we'd want this just to be a revenue raising measure. So we'd want to implement what you described to me, which is to say, we stay the way we are following all the relevant state laws. Um, we have this charter exclusively to allow us to raise this uh, transfer tax, right? How expensive would it be to go through that process of drafting that sort of document and a ballot measure and 
that sort of thing. How much do we have to pay? I, I would hate to dig in into a hole further on the promise of something um, to get us out of the hole. So the data that we have is limited. I know that people uh, think it's millions of dollars, uh, but that seems to be a urban legend. Uh, or maybe it's accurate for San Jose, but not for us. <laughs> Al Los Al our data came from Los Altos Hills, mm -hmm. uh, where the staff proposed to the town council to do exactly what you just said. Charter, which says very little, changes very little, and a real property transfer tax. They wanted to do it. This meeting was held in May, and they wanted to do it in the November election, which means they had until August to get it to the county. Um, the town council did not approve that. They wanted to go slower. Um, their estimate was $150,000 for the entire process, and of which I don't have the details in front of me, but part of it was um, consultants to evaluate what the town's population um, would vote for. So how, how they, what numbers they use and, and uh, which arguments made sense. So it was legal expense. It was time for the, for the, um, for the staff, communications. a communications bill and a, and oh. a consultant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the consultant and the, is gonna be for any tax measure. You're gonna have to test uh, and hire consultants to, to do, help you with this. And so the real the question is, what's the incremental cost? And there clearly is an incremental cost of creating, having the town go through the process. There are going to be meetings. Um, there's going to be a law fee to create this uh, charter. Well, if, if we could do this, this would clearly be superior because that way we don't have to tinker with the open space fund uh, allocation, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to address any sort of windfall income from this property, transfer tax. Um, I like Michelle's idea of simultaneously restoring to the town council authority they used to have that lapsed uh, under a wrinkle in the law to reduce the percentage from the full 5% based on surpluses uh, in the five event and a half. they became, yeah, five and a half, sorry. And um, that way we're not raising taxes on anyone on a day-to-day -day basis, which of course is good because everybody's expenses are going up too much. Um, but there is this tax you have to factor in when you're selling your home or it's eventually sold, but that's much less of a regular occurrence for people. So I like it. You want to do some scenarios? Yeah. On my spreadsheet? <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Yeah, we should play with that. Yeah. So... Uh, okay, so Tony, before we do scenarios, based on that whole conversation, and, and you're the professional yeah. in the room, or just volunteer? The subject matter expert. What, what do you think, uh, yeah, you're the subject matter expert, thank you. What, what path do you think we should spend our time investigating and helping with? Put me on the spot. Um, I, I think we should look at multiple scenarios and see which one actually generates the objective of rebuilding our reserves. Um, and then from there, we can decant to which strategy is going to work. Because, um, I mean, we can, I, like right here, I plugged in 1.5 million for real property transfer tax. And just looking at our expenses right now, we have to cut probably 1.5 million from the budget on the expense side, just with that 1.5 million addition, additional revenue, because we're still showing expenses greater than reserves or greater than revenues. So yeah, what year is that? Confusing me. You, you'd said we had about a one and a half million dollar hole at the high end. Right. So but if we we'd, have... we'd, we'd have to look at the expense side as well. Sure. So, and we haven't we haven't really talked about that. Oh, in terms of reducing expenses. Yes, we have to reduce oh, expenses. Yeah. You know, so it's it's, you know, right now the two point I've, I've got two point three million, in for staffing for salaries, and that's based on current that's staff levels right now. 
it's it's this it's on the screen here i'm sorry Ken. no you're gonna get it tonight okay so you can well it's, it's this one right it's, it's, one, it's this one that, yeah you received the pdf we received the PDF. okay it's this. You can barely see it. So. Oh, yeah. It's this. So, but, yeah. but I mean, just, just the way this works, I've got, a, I've got a column here for assumptions. And you can plug in, you know, 4% for property tax, 3% for sales tax. And it'll, it'll adjust the numbers. That's a growth rate. Is that right? Growth rate? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, Tony, you're saying 1.5 million without expense reduction. Yeah, the, but there's still some other uh, components. So franchise fees. Yeah, clearly, clearly we need to we rein need. in expenses. You already commented on the housing element related mm -hmm. consultant costs mm -hmm. and more effective use of legal counsel. I, I'm the one that was just arguing we go against San Mateo, so I understand that it sounds across purposes, but uh, I'm all for um, every time we think about using an expensive outside resource, we, we think carefully about whether it, it hits the threshold or not. Right. So if we add the real property transfer, that's an additional 1.5 million, and revenues will come in at 8.8, and then keep expenses at 7.4 million. That's a 1.5 million dollar hit. Now. The other item is we're going to have capital projects as well. So we can make an assumption of are we going to do 400,000 a year for capital projects? Well, we have to define, we actually have to have a CIP process where we actually, here's the projects that need to be done. Here's how much we're willing to com you know, commit on, on an annual basis. But for this scenario, let's just assume we're going to do 400,000 a year for capital projects. Okay. That's putting money into our streets. You know, it strikes me that these are policy issues we're talking about all of a sudden, um, and not financial issues. Um, you know, how much money we spend on the streets versus how much money we spend on consultants is not our pay grade. Um, and that if the town council needs help from the finance committee evaluating some financial alternatives, that's fine, but they should set the policy as to whether we spend as we have in the past years or whether we can increase it or decrease it. And so we're going through this process so that we can make recommendations for policy. I mean, that's, for me, it's, I, I, want, I want to go through this process so that I can go to council and say, here's how much we need to commit to streets. I mean, I understand the policy considerations, but for the scenarios, we have to plug in a number. Well, I'm just saying that we're not the uh, subject matter experts when it comes to this kind of policy on streets and capital expenditures, or even consultants and how much money we spend on legal fees, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something which um, we're, isn't our objective. But what we can do is talk about um, what we believe to be valid ways of filling whatever the hole is. I mean, any of these numbers, uh, these taxes, we can set the rate, fill the hole. Whether or not people will vote for it is another issue. To, to that point, um, we given that we may or may not have audited financials by the time uh, we have to do this, I think it's going to be super important to show the trade-offs to the community in terms of Correct. increased taxes versus reduced services. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time on the revenue side and, and obviously touched on the costs earlier. Um, there's a couple of questions. So the, the lawyer or the legal bills, um, that's a huge number. Right. And I guess a lot of it was related to the housing element. Yeah. Housing element and other issues. And do you, who, you may not know this, but who has the approval authority to, to engage the outside council? And is it, is it restricted? Um, is there oversight? In terms of just how much legal time is it used? Well, staff can access the attorney, council can access the attorney. Um, it's just there's not been a 
a regulation a regulator on the access um so that's something that we need to address but okay. that's you know staff and the and the city council can access the city attorney or the town attorney and can... I guess we can and she's also us. responded I believe she's also responded to email requests from residents so. yeah yeah I, I mean it seems like it's a policy point but it's an important one because that's just it seems right. like we're hemorrhaging on legal um and then on the salaries the savings was largely one time right I assume that's because of that maybe we've got we quite a few town vacancies manager. With, with town manager but we also have other positions we have one one employee who's on leave for six months and we've had other positions that are vacant and we're just accumulating is, those savings is there an effort to prioritize services and the employees necessary against those services that's an assessment we need to do is what's the right size of ftes and what's the right size of consultants and, and is that is that being undertaken that's going to be undertaken. okay um and is planning still considered to be something that's on the list for outsourcing? Again, it's what the assessment okay. would, that it's it's because we, we're hiring staff for planning right now and building, and things have turned around in that department over the last month. Uh, so it seems to be working now, but again, it's staff retention is going to be an issue. Um, so if we lose a, another person in building or planning, then we're back at square one. And when do we expect to get the fee analysis completed? Uh, they're projecting a nine-month timeline. So okay. if we go now, it'll be just around July. So we haven't engaged anybody yet. Uh, we're we have we selected the consultants. The contract is going to council next week. Okay. And my last uh, point on the expenses, and again, maybe not for you, um, since we have to engage the sheriff or some other police service to to provide public safety. Um, did we ever do an analysis on what the appropriate FTE service level is from the sheriff? And do we need what, what either they've pro proposed or we've agreed to? Yeah, the contract from is five and a quarter. Right. Can yeah. we reduce that? I mean, I, I don't know if we want to. That's, but... that's part of the negotiations with, with council and because I believe that there was a subcommittee that negotiated the contract with the sheriff. Uh, yeah. And th this is part of what I meant by allocating overhead. I think it used to be that they charged us for the patrol people out here and assumed that the infrastructure behind them from dispatchers to management was a fixed cost. Right. Now we're being allocated proportional time, prorated time for all that formerly fixed costs that they would have to incur. And I would argue they, they would have to incur it no matter what just to run their department. So that was then yeah. having overhead recovery at our expense. Yeah. It's giving access and, to and, a and, and again back to my hobby horse my, my argument in in a, a legal thing would be uh, as a tea city etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, it's assuming that if we're paying for law enforcement it's the incremental cost not them reallocating overhead to me if they're doing that they've got to give me back some of my property tax revenue or they could return the contract we used to have in terms of overhead and then we could call it square but you can't do both ends of this that would be my argument i, I don't know if it has any legal weight at all Okay. Well, I, I know that we've looked into this, but it seems to me that maybe adjusting down the full-time equivalents, if that's a possibility, I don't know. And and therefore reduce service levels, obviously, right. um, or theoretically maybe. Um, but I think that needs to be something that we've looked at. So if we're asking the community to provide more tax revenue, that we've looked at that. And what, what does that imply in terms of mm -hmm. response times and, and so forth? Um, I guess I lied. My last point was... We talked a little bit about this in the last meeting about to the extent we can allocate trails, maintenance, and bridges on trails, construction, all those things that are currently, I think, coming out of the general fund. Right. Um, if we can really focus on uh, applying those into the open space fund to the extent they are relatively right. aligned with open space. Okay. Well, we, I mean, we can go through that process. And if that's the recommendation, then we'll make that recommendation to the budget and council can say yes or no. So there is some maintenance charges already, right? Because you could see some expenses against the open space. I thought we discussed this a few years ago, and I, I, I thought some, I'm not sure it's how much. I believe there has been in the past, but like the, the bulk of trail maintenance is being paid for by the general. No, yeah. at the moment. Yeah, and I, I, I looked, I don't have it in front of me. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars, I think. It wasn't, it was meaningful. It doesn't fix our problem. 
that we could charge or again i based on the line items and in terms of what they look to be uh relating to trails and bridges and, and repairs and so forth that again i, I might be wrong maybe they, they aren't open space but based on the line item description it seems like they might be So it seems like there's a number of things that we should work on. Um, one is that I think we need to clearly understand the lag time between an election and when we would actually get cash um, for each of the three possibilities, UUT, parcel, and RPDT. Those are our three options. Um, and we, sh we, we need, as a group here, we need to focus on the key issue here of raising money, not on the, uh, the short-term issues in George's um, presentation, um, the things we need to do pretty quickly and not worry too, uh, we shouldn't be spending our time worrying about things that are midterm or long-term at this point. I mean, because the reality is if, if we don't put one of these on the ballot and it gets approved, the alternative is pretty darn grim. Yeah, and, th and that's where uh, right now I'm seeing two courses of action, and I would like at the next meeting if we could return with, as you're alluding to, Ken, pros and cons in a structured way of both. One of those pros or cons would be the voting threshold required to gain approval for the measure, and the one was the one I outlined of, you know, fiddle with the open space fund on a temporary basis to redirect that portion of UUT to general fund and a parcel tax. Uh, what I think Michelle, you and Ken have talked about, but particularly Michelle is, which I like, is Charter Town Light, I'm calling it, you know, we, we have a charter, but it's really simple. We have a property tax transfer tax, and then uh, we simultaneously return to the town council its ability to adjust the general fund portion of the UUT downward in order to make sure that we're not bringing in too much money uh, in a buoyant real estate market say. And that way the open space fund is unchanged. Uh, there's no special taxes that are being touched. And so I would imagine that's a majority is what I heard, but we'll want to verify that. Are, are those kind of the two? Does anyone have a third sort of recommendation of a third path of action? And, and of course we have expense reduction in the mix here, as well as this idea of looking whether open space maintenance uh, can be charged to the open space fund, stuff like that. But that's relatively small beer in the scheme of things. Well, yeah, the open space fund is about 360000 a year, right? In terms of expenses on maintenance of open space? No, in terms of revenue. Oh. The yeah, UUT is 361000 The forecast is... Oh, okay. So that's, you know, a quarter of what we perhaps need, right? So... Modifying that, although it's one possibility, um, probably doesn't get us very far. Well, and I think that's the supermajority threshold, as I had you all explain it to me. I don't have independent knowledge of that, but I think. Well, it, it's a special tax, so it would be yeah. two thirds. Two thirds, yeah. Okay. Par parcel tax and the so and the reallocation EVT. It's a two thirds. So threshold. that's harder to adjust than the charter town and the. Property transfer tax, I understand. Is yeah, that's coming into the general fund. And yeah, that's just. Yeah, well, that would be a significant do. consideration because, yeah. um, you know, I, I understand I, I'm not a fan of more tax too. So I understand why the supermajority requirements for greater taxes, but given the emergency we're facing and not wanting to run out of money, considering how many voters need to approve it. Why does a parcel tax going to the general fund require two thirds? It's a special tax. That's the way. The law has set it up. Really? So yeah, any, for cities, it's 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 a special tax. So any parcel tax, but period? parcel to the schools have a little right. bit more relaxed. Fifty-five or something. Yeah. Fifty-five percent. So any yeah. parcel tax requires a super majority. Yeah, because they they the even voters, though it goes the voters. I mean, Prop Thirteen passed, and then we've had Prop Two Eighteen. Prop, I mean, all these propositions, and I think the last one was reducing that threshold to fifty-five percent for school. Right. Uh, I think isn't there some proposition for bond? I guess it maybe for bonds or something. Right. 
Wow. So quick clarification on the 55%, those act, and that's just for capital projects. That's not for operating funds. For school for, for schools. School, correct. Oh wow. So okay. So <laughs> George, are you still gonna go with the with the parcel tax? Well, well, no, I I'm just saying these are the two scenarios that we've heard so far. I think clearly yours is the one that I'd prefer. Um but <laughs> Uh, it makes a lot more sense, but I mean, in terms of options, I, I, I'm going to learn more about all of them just to nail this down for the next meeting. Um, and I'm just wondering if anyone else has a proposal of a, a third way, so to speak, that we haven't already considered. And by the way, with respect to the clock, I like to try to keep these meetings to two hours roughly. And so I would propose if, if we don't object that we um, focus on this item and we, we carry over the second item on the audit. Uh, review and management memorandum of internal control because that would seem a little anticlimactic and I, I do want to get to public comment on all this before we I, I just want to make one more comment is we do we are electing two new town council members here in a month or so and yeah I guess I'd like I would prefer waiting till a lot of these issues get resolved once they're on board since they would be the ones having to declare a fiscal emergency and all this other stuff I don't know how the timing might not allow that. Okay. So you'd have peep town if current you town. Put it, if you want to put the ballot measure in March, then then there's not enough time. Yeah, then it's December. Well, the good news is there's an election and uh, elections help decide issues and the candidates can let us know where they all stand. Um, and that that again to to take was it Ken said it's beyond our pay grade. I, that's beyond my pay grade here too on the finance committee. Uh, in terms of who's elected doing what, I think we should just keep proceeding doing our job the best we can. And of course, the town council members, whoever they happen to be, are always free to make the final decision. Address them as they see fit. So you asked George, uh, what kinds of, uh, how do we compare these three alternatives? Well, I, I have two that I've heard, and if there's a third, well, well, the third I guess is waiting. Two alternatives. Well, yeah, there were two main plans of action. There was the one that I mentioned. There's one that I like better uh, that Michelle talked about a lot and that you also contributed to planning others. I'm just wondering if there are any others, a mix of, you know, do this, that, and the other, and we fix our whole. Um, yeah, I understand Michelle's, and your first one was? The first one was uh, that we, uh, and again, it's a higher voting threshold, but we redirect the open space fund uh, portion of the UUT temporarily to um, uh, to the general fund, or you could just have a general tax increase. I guess that would have a lower um, impact of the general fund percentage going up. So either tinker with OSF percentage or increase from the five and a half percent to something higher. Um, and then you have a parcel tax. Um, and between those two elements, you plug our hole. Um, and then Michelle's view was that, well, we could just do a very simple charter town, do a property transfer tax. And then if that brings in too much money, you deal with that by giving the town council back the right they had that lapsed a few years back to reduce the general fund portion of the UUT as, as they need to, because if they're high revenues on property tax transfer, you could do that. So I'm not sure I understand what's the value of a combination of UUT and parcel tax. Why not UUT or parcel tax? Well, it, it was mainly, option. yeah, it was just, just to try to deal with the fact of, um, first of all, diverse diversification of sources of revenue. Um, the fact that UUT grows with inflation, parcel tax doesn't, it's a fixed amount. Uh, and to get $400,000 out of UUT is 2%. But to get a uh, million and a half dollars, well, that would be 14% uh, addition, which just seemed to be sufficiently high enough to change people's behavior where they wouldn't want to be using the services that are generating that much tax. I mean, uh, there's, you know, the whole Laffer curve thing is real at some level. And uh, um, having super high taxes that range about 20% of what you're actually paying for, that doesn't really work so well for people, I don't think. I hear you, but um, whether you pay 20% for one tax or 10% for two taxes, it's still 20%. Uh, it's yeah. still the same amount of money. Yeah, I get it. But um, Keep it simple. Well, Michelle made the point, though, that 
uh, property taxes are deductible and they may be again, uh, depending on what happens with tax law and the election on the presidential level. Um, uh, you know, paying your monthly bills every month is a different thing from budgeting for annual taxes. Uh, as I said before, I think the superior alternative, if we could do it, would be a charter town. Because if I'm selling my house for whatever it's worth, typically, if you, I mean, there are certainly uh, uh, unusual circumstances where this would be meaningful in terms of a loss on someone who just bought a house but then found they had to immediately sell it. Generally speaking, property values go up and to the right around here historically. And so, by and large, I'm uh, uh, if I pay a property transfer tax, I'm not, provided it's not outrageous, super motivated to avoid that or complain. And I, I think with the recent National Realtors Association settlement that you pointed out in your report, um, commissions may be going down somewhat. So it may be a wash economically. I think it's better. Yeah. So we had we identified some time ago when we started this process, seven areas where we tried to um, evaluate these things. Our report, since I'm the one who, who recommended those seven, it's not surprising that our report actually addressed those seven. Why don't we have someone put together those seven ideas, you know, in terms of appeal to voters and anticipated revenues, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do it for my scenario since I proposed it, but I'm letting you know I already <laughs> like yours better, but just in the spirit of being thorough. You know, I, I was trained that uh, I can't have an opinion unless I'm willing to be on both sides of a debate. So, uh, <laughs> so I will do my homework on this one, too. That's very fair. Oh, this, pardon? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, any more discussion here before I open it for questions? I, I would imagine we may have some comments, questions from that side. Yeah, just, just one comment. This is actually directed to Tor Tony. So Tony and I started the exact same day along with Chris Whitler. And I just want to say, having spent my entire career in finance, I just want to commend you and really, frankly, thank you on behalf of at least this particular member. I mean, you have been responsive. You, you have been actually the joy to work with. And I think that's particularly important in this context to say that because the town clearly has an issue with uh, staff turnover. I would hate hate to see staff turnover in the finance department. So to the extent that I think we've all done a, tr I think we've done a tremendous job tonight of not shooting the messenger on a very, very difficult message. Hopefully that has actually come through. So I just wanted to, the other thing that I learned, and I hope you don't mind me divulging this, is something that Steve and I learned in our meeting with you going through our subcommittee group is that you have a personal sacrifice of a huge commute every single day to get here from Salinas to be here I'm not sure if that's widely known in the community or among the, the among the, the committee. Did not but know I, that. But I just want to actually express that appreciation for the commitment that you've had for this town, and hopefully that continues going forward because, frankly, the town really needs you. Here, here. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, I, I agree 100%. Uh, uh, Tony, just it's been a delight working with you so far, and I hope we get to do this for a much longer. <laughs> I, I say so far because I'm hoping we get to do this for a much longer period of time. I do too. And to the point where the fruits of your labor are realized in terms of improving our reporting and getting everything under control. And then hopefully you'll have to do far less effort to just keep things. It's much more straightforward to keep things running smoothly than it is to fix things when they're going wrong. I, I would like to add that the, the, the last three meetings with the Finance Committee, I mean, it's been really healthy conversations, frank conversations, and, and willingness to actually explore the topics that you were given um, I, I, I just want to commend you all uh, it's, I've enjoyed working with the finance George, I mean I do I echo those sentiments um, and I think I think we have the the brain power and the willpower to um, uh, get us out of this uh, crisis that's great and if you can stop screen sharing so I can see who might have their hands up that'll be good Oh, and uh, Betsy Morgenthaler here in the room has her hand up. So she's physically here. So the people in the room get preference uh, ahead of those online. It's to encourage everyone to show up. Um, here you go, Betsy. I'm going to save more of my remarks for your next meeting than this meeting, but I really want to commend Mark for speaking so appropriately, effectively, loud and clear. Tony, I'm ready to build an ABU for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never received such bad news. Um, with such grace because 
sometimes bad news, you know, you feel like you've met the, the ground. And it's been a long time um, that I've been showing up for these meetings where I thought we were wildly ungrounded. Just a couple of quick points, because this is about healthy communication. And we've done such a good um, job of it here tonight. Um, one, one of the things that um, spoke to me when Mayor Wernickoff, um weighed in earlier was that there's a real, what I perceive as a breakdown in communication between our two most important committees. I, I, I don't mean to offend any other committees, uh, nor my own, but between you and the, and the town council, um, this is where the rubber meets the road. <clears throat> when Sarah spoke to the information not getting passed on to the town council, very important information, that would be one of many examples that I've seen. So that needs to be made a much more robust conduit, could be part of policies, but I think we need to think long and hard about that. Um, as well, as you go forward, I don't think any of you would particularly like to put something um, in front of the voters to see that go down in flames. And there's sufficient frustration in the community that I meet um, that if it were on the ballot today, it probably would do that. Um, so I urge you all to think creatively and productively about how we bring this town around. And it is not only beholden on the town residents um, to show up and pay attention. I think you need to start to reach out and productive ways to reach out, I think, are to take um, the policies I heard Tony mentioned policies, I would, yes, I'm so pleased. Um, that's an area because Tony's about the operations, but you and the town council do the policies and the directives. And I'd really like to see you review the Woodside policies or whoever you think is out there has best practices and start to apply some of those here. So we have that to rely on. And there is a conduit to feed back to our Town staff. As well, I heard very gratefully the, um, the proposal that we do some cost cutting. And I personally think that the town would receive that very favorably. I know there was a subcommittee over here that looked at cost cutting, and I think it's very important that we come back to the town with some of that to complement the increase in taxes. Um, the rest of my comments I will say for you individually. Thank you so much for today. Thanks, Betsy. And I think, um, oh, uh, I see Sarah Wernickoff, you have your hand up, Sarah? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in so there's no misunderstanding. My comment was intended to say that there was no conversation with the council, because all council, all, all, of, all of the dialogue is through public meeting. And so I simply was trying to clarify that, that that had any discussion had been made um, with the previous town manager through council meetings and in a public forum. That's all. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, clarification. Um, let's see. David Cardinal, I see you have your hand up. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, a few quick comments. First of all, um, at the risk of piling on, I thought that was a great presentation. And I'm really impressed by how far we've come in terms of having a grip on things. So congratulations to finance director McFarland and he better not quit ever. So I just want to say that right now. Uh, yeah. Second, I think the real property transfer tax is our best single idea. Um, and I agree with like the San Helena approach of if we just say we want to do that one thing, it's a really good idea. Um, on the other hand, I do worry, and we need to fight this. There's a lot of other people talking about charter cities because they want to like fight the state, or you know, we could get into a morass and all the budgetary considerations for drafting the charter city, the charter, and the election kind of assume that you have your act together. So uh, I think that would be the risk is that we, I don't know, fiddle around for a year and argue over it. But I do think that's a, an amazing idea. It can be sliding scale. So for those people 
there are any left who sell a house for less than a million or whatever, they might not have to pay. Um, on the sheriff contract, the sheriff, I think, would be happy to provide us with less or more. Um, roughly, we want um, currently one full-time equivalent, which sounds pretty cheap, but at 168 hours a week, that's basically over four full-time equivalents. Plus, you've got vacation time and sick time and training time um, and the salaries and overhead here are very high, partially because the cost of living is very high. So we're paying roughly $400,000 for each of those full-time equivalents. So we can quibble about that. I, I'm all for arguing about the overhead. I'm all for arguing about whatever. Um, and But if we, you know, the traffic accident here, there's three here, and Woodside has two full-time equivalents. So I, I think we need to think about people want like more safety or whatever they want. They've got to pay up um, or get the Woodside Patrol to run around in little cars, which would be fine. Um, and then um, on the cutting costs, I kind of, I sort of get that, but I think there's a lot of fictional, we have a lot of, you know, consultants. Okay, fine. And some of those were wasted money, some not. Some are contractors for the planning department and other departments. And if we didn't pay them money, we would have to pay an employee money. Um, and then some are, okay, we need to do this thing. But other than that, it's like, well, okay, we can cut costs how? What do you not want? Do you want less hours at the town hall? Um, people have to like own up and grow up, I think, which is the final part about like, oh, voters are frustrated. They won't approve more taxes. Well, okay, do they want a town? I mean, you know, at some level, like with the sheriff, it's like, do you want people to come out here and respond when your house gets broken into? So I think some of this is admittedly, you know, that we have to help the town grow up and not, it's our town, it's our money, it's our services. So I, yeah, I think you're doing great stuff. And a bunch of these proposals are a really good idea and we'll probably need more than one. Um, so I'm all in, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate those comments. Um, let's see, I see a telephone numbers so please identify who you are just six five zero four zero zero something something this is Anna. it's ed wells ed wells here michelle can you handle that i'm, I'm sorry it's hard hard to understand you can you repeat again who is this it's dana green i oh, was dana I, terrific i was yeah. trying to speak in ed wells language because ed was so fabulous anyway I am calling for two things, and one I put on the forum this week, and I should have written to you guys um, because I really got, want you to take this on. The sheriff substation, which is next to the field and is unnecessary. Other towns don't need to provide sheriff substations. When we have so few employees in town hall, you give the sheriff a desk at the town hall or a cubby and you take the substation and you rent it as an office or you see what the hell is in there. And if it needs a kitchenette, you put in a kitchenette and you rent it for two or $3,000 a month. Bam, starting now. In, 19, uh, in 2019, the town council voted to secure and protect the frog pond over at Corte Madera School. It was never put into permanent production, uh, uh, you know, protection. There is $100,000 to $120,000 secured money for, for to go with that purchase. That could, all those things could show up right away for you guys. But, you know, it needs to be, it just never got put in motion. So I hope these things can get put in motion. We're trying to help. I also think having a a, a, a charrette, a, a financial charrette, the, the people of the town who are coming to me all the time now, who are big time financial people, we want to help. We want to help the, the finance committee. You know, so let's let's hear from the people, for God's sake. I mean, everybody is 
everybody wants to help right now. So let's tap into the voices. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Uh, really interesting ideas. Um, any other hands in the room, outside the room? Oh, I see a hand. Rebecca Flynn, is that a hand? Yes, up? yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Rebecca Flynn. I'm running for town council. And I um, have a few clarifying questions that I'd like to get answered at some point. I want to first start by thanking everybody on the town uh, finance committee, as well as Tony and his team mm -hmm. for all of your hard work. Um, I, I personally, and I'm sure everybody in town really appreciates that we're getting um, our finances back in order. Um, the couple of clarifying questions that I have is, uh, Tony, you had mentioned a couple of comments that I would love to get a little bit more information about. You had said that um, revenues still need to be posted and that journal entries are still being um, evaluated and entered. And it wasn't clear to me if that's, it sounded like that went all the way back to 2021. And I just wanted to kind of get the understand the background of why some of our revenue was never put into our accounts. Uh, if that was an issue of new software or if it was just, it, it's unclear to me how we misplaced revenue and expenses. So maybe you could clarify that. And then I'm also confused about the timeline for potential um, parcel tax, charter towns, whatever, where we have to go back to the voters. Um, from what I'm hearing is that by March 2025, the town council needs to declare a fiscal emergency. And it's unclear to me if all the audits would need to be completed by that date in order to declare that, or if we can move uh, forward with sort of partially audited years. And then my understanding is that by the end of July, 2025, we would need to submit all, get certified by the, the county and then we would have a special election. It's unclear to me if that election would be November or sometime before that. And then I'm unclear on what the actual cost of a special election because um, the, the subcommittee that was investigating the transfer tax charter city idea mentioned 150,000 as potential costs that Los Altos Hills is, is incurring, but they were planning for a um, measure to go to the voters in no, this November. So it wouldn't have been a special election. So there's a big cost involved in running our own special election. So I would love to get clarification on that. Um, I had on my list the question about um, uh, billing the open space fund, which was answered already. But we, I think a, a suggestion at the last meeting was also to bill for the management of all these funds. So I don't know if that's still, that's a minor thing, but any minor, any little thing will help us. So I don't know if that's still one of the kind of expenses, small things that, that we can tackle. Um, I was, someone mentioned that we were collect about 300 to 400,000, that's 2% of our UUT. That goes to the open space fund, but I hear that the open space fund is on the order of $12 million. So it sounds like if we're collecting 300,000 a year, We've been collecting that money for a very, very long time. So I, I'm unclear about what the perp, what the plans are to use that money um, and when we last spent the money and what options we have for actually using it for open space. And then my final question, I'm sorry to hit you with so many, is this idea of charter, charter town that's very restrictive to just sort of a, the property, the transfer tax. I presume that could also be a little bit broader in terms of allowing town council to have other taxes involved. I don't know, but that's something to explore because perhaps we should be looking at vacancy taxes or rental taxes. That, I mean, it wouldn't generate a huge amount of money, but maybe there's a little bit there. The question I have is in terms of a charter town, does each time town council wants to explore a new tax, does it have to go back to the voters or because we're a charter town, the town council then has that option to, um, to have a new tax. So those are all my questions and I appreciate all the, the information everybody has, has given and um, all your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, just uh, wondering if um, uh, the, the comment about journal entries and postings and things like that, any comment on that? Yes. Um, yes, we did implement a new software system 
Um, there were issues with some of the subsidiary databases that were working feeding into the general ledger. Um, and yes, the 23, 22, 23 is the one that got the brunt of the, the, the issues. Uh, but yes, we are still posting for 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24. Um, also the timeline, um, if we want to have a special election in March, we need to have a fiscal de declaration of fiscal emergency in December. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. You mean March of 2025, 2025 March of 2025, which is earlier than Rebecca. Right. That know. way we can have the, the election certified before July, because that's when we have to submit all our special taxes. Uh, to the property, uh, to the assessor's office. Um, early estimates on a special election is 50,000. Um, however, if other jurisdictions have a special election along with us, then those costs get spread out. Um, and then um, Open Space Fund has $8 million and the how inclusionary housing has 4 million. So that's where the 12 million uh, comes from, but that's over almost half of our total portfolio is tied up in those two funds and the specific purposes for those open space is for the preservation and acquisition of open space and um, inclusionary housing is for affordable yeah. housing. And, and my understanding is all these funds, including special accounts, the, the allocation is via the town council, of course, mm -hmm. in terms of pulling the trigger on using them for their intended right. purpose. There is an open space committee which uh, thinks long and hard about open space issues. And so that's sort of beyond the scope of this committee, right. I think. All right. Um, any other folks online who want to weigh in here before we wrap up for this evening? Okay. A as mentioned earlier, I, I propose that we carry over the audit schedule discussion and memorandum of internal control to future meeting. Um, th this is obviously time is of the essence here. And um, I think we've had a full exploration of the issues tonight. I think we should all go and uh, do more homework on our uh, proposed areas. As you get further numbers, Tony, I'm sure you'll share them with us, including uh, concerning the budget update and expenses. Absolutely. And then and we're going to meet in two weeks. In time. two weeks, yes. And um, I'll send the my little fiscal forecast scenario to all the committee yeah. members. That's, and that's brilliant. And then we, we should all work on that. And we should start thinking, you know, pretty quickly about making recommendations at the coming meetings, understanding there'll be new members of the town council and turnover and whatever. But mm -hmm. It needs to be a public discussion about this, uh, um, and we have an election, and so that'll be a topic of the election, which is good, too. And if anyone has suggestions, issues, and how to draft the narrative, I'm more than open to hearing your suggestions. Okay, that's great. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? All right, second. I'll second. second. All right, in favor? We are adjourned at 6.07. Thank you, everyone.